Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, let me just introduce the panel. We will open now with young journalists from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Before we start, I wanted just to invite on the stage one of the representatives of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, member of Board of Directors, Joanna Levison, who will now just briefly introduce this important institution we have the honor to host in Prague. Joanna, please join me on the stage. Oh, is my mic on? Yeah. yeah. Well, first I want to thank Mr. Fisher for kind introduction. He's uh, been an inspiration and a partner uh, with Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty for the last several years. So it's a pleasure to be on the podium with him. Uh, it's just obviously a pleasure to be here with the Václav Havel Journalism Fellows and the Iži Dean Spear Journalism Fellows today. And I thank the Václav Havel Library and the Doc Center for including them in the program today. Um, what better? an opportunity to have to talk about the Václav Havel European Dialogues than to have the Václav Havel Journalism Fellows and the Ije Dean Spear Journalism Fellows with us today. Uh, I just want to mention that both fellowship programs are a um, joint initiative between Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty and the Czech Foreign Ministry and we, we are grateful to the Czech Foreign Ministry for its partnership in conducting these programs. Both programs build, as you can imagine, on the uh, work that their, um, that, that their namesakes um, did on behalf of democracy and human rights here in the Czech Republic, both Václav Havel and Jiří Dinsvěr Sr. Um, Um, I, I want to say on behalf of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, it's just been a privilege to have these fellows with us over the last six months in Prague. Um, I think they represent the best of the best. They are young, uh, intrepid, very courageous, very intelligent journalists, and they extend our mission. Our mission is to promote human rights and democracy and media freedom around the world, and these wonderful young people are really at the forefront of that fight. And and uh, we, it, it gives us great optimism and uh, it inspires us to know that they will go on and uh, continue their work as independent journalists in their countries promoting media freedom everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that uh, introduction, let me just uh, propose you a format of our meeting. Uh, we have uh, five journalists Everyone is uh, very rich in his history and in his ambitions, and, or in her ambitions. And I think that we might bridge the morning session with their viewpoints and with the, the panel that uh, will follow just afterwards. So, uh, without further uh, delays, I would like to invite uh, Stefan, who comes uh, from Moldova, just to make a short introduction and maybe raise an issue that he was inspired by in this uh, morning debate. And maybe if there are people who you see in the audience, Stefan, just do not uh, hesitate to raise also questions to them, because I think that the, the dialogue we can have now between you on the stage and those who preceded you in the morning is maybe one of the preci um, precious occasions uh, to seize. So, Stefan, the floor is yours. Uh, good day, and um, I'm very honored to be here. First of all, I want to mention that. And uh, to get straight to the point, uh, I'm from Moldova and I'm a journalist working over there and uh, all I want to mention is that uh, Moldova is going nowadays through some challenging times and we are mentioning uh, mainly two factors and the main, the main political factor uh, if, you are, if we are mentioning media the main political factor is that uh, there is much and much more control of uh, political control of media and uh, this is uh, something unfortunate for uh, our country. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, European Union, it's a really interesting um, and it's an uh, aspiration for uh, most of uh, Moldovans because, uh, because for, first of all, in my case and uh, in my, from my point, um, 
Moldova is already kind of connected to European Union because one of the official languages of European Union is of course Romanian and we in Moldova speak the same language uh, as Romanians do and one other important connection is that uh, let's say nearly half of the million of Moldovan citizens have or uh, have already Romanian citizens so in a way we have uh, we are pretty connected to European Union and uh, everything which, uh, which, which is happening in the European Union uh, concerns a lot of people from Moldova because of course we have a lot of people from Moldova who are working inside of European Union. So this is, uh, it's really important uh, for Moldova to have, uh, to have um, a bridge, to have uh, a bridge towards the civil, to Western civilization and it's really important to Moldova to be um, anchored um, to our, towards um, Western society. Stefan, way. one of the issues you are interested in is the way international help uh, comes uh, to Moldova in order to uh, ease, to help Moldovan society and Moldovan economy. In what terms would you see the European engagement in, in Moldova in favor of uh, uh, anchoring Moldova in the European integration process? Is there something that you were interested uh, or inspired by in the morning debate? Okay. Uh, this morning I was um, watching, uh, I was really inspired by the words which were mentioned in a way that, that uh, in European Union was created as a um, as a factor to, you know, in a way, ignore geopolitics, if I'm uh, right. Uh, I think geopolitics, I, I was a student of, uh, I studied uh, foreign uh, relations and international relations, and I think geopolitics, it is, was, and will be um, <clears throat> a really important factor. And uh, I think even the European Union was created to avoid some kind of, uh, to avoid the um, war, in a way, uh, in European Union. <clears throat> and uh, by avoiding war and by uh, creating a stability space on the European continent is and can be qualified, in my opinion, as a geopolitical factor. And uh, geopolitics, even though somebody might avoid this word, I think it's playing a really important part and played a really important part as the creation of European Union in this process of creation of European Union and maintaining and then expanding it towards the former, uh, f former uh, socialist uh, members bloc. Yeah. Thank you very much, Stefan. The next on my list is Salome. Salome, you come from Georgia. Uh, you are interested uh, in ethnic minorities, religious minorities, in EU identity, in European identity. <coughs> In the light of this morning debate, what was the issue where the most uh, inspired by and what you would like to be debated uh, uh, tonight? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I should uh, share the, uh, what, what Stefan mentioned. Uh, this is a big honor for me and for all of us to be here because uh, to, to be the Havel Fellow and to, to talk here uh, in front of this uh, audience. Uh, so this is, again, this is a big responsibility and thank you for inviting us here. Uh, what about this day? Uh, uh, these topics, identity, European policy, uh, nationalism, the, yes, it, it become very interesting for me three years ago when uh, there was an active discussion if Georgian, Georgians are um, the European nation or not. And um, the part of uh, political parties we are trying to uh, assuring societies that yes, we are the European, uh, we have this European identity. And the next part of, uh, and there was some division because there was thought in uh, Georgian society that no, no, we should think that we, we, we are not, uh, um, uh, maybe we are or are not this uh, European society. Uh, and uh, I decided just to to, to learn um, the theories, to have answers on this uh, important question, and became this master student in uh, of nationalism and ethnicity studies at Tbilisi State University, and it gave me some theoretical background just to think uh, uh, about this question: if Georgia is a European country, its society, uh, or not. Uh, 
Uh, of course, uh, I have some um, theoretical and historical uh, background that we are this uh, uh, European country and I'm really proud that we are uh, trying to, to, to be t uh, every day to, to, to show our European face when we are uh, when we have the more uh, liberal um, society, the freedom, uh, free media, because when we're comparing uh, Georgia to other regional countries, maybe Armenia, Azerbaijan, and um, uh, the other countries from post-Soviet, uh, fr from the Soviet Union, uh, yes, we are a little bit ahead. But uh, we still have uh, to talk more about what does it mean to be the European country. And uh, I think um, I think society, in the society there should be more more discussion about uh, what will uh, the advantages we will have to be the part of European Union because sometimes uh Society is disappointed that uh, what we have if we become the part of European Union. Of course, we have reports, we have uh, figures that people are uh, accepting, that people are, people are supporting the European Union, and the numbers are rising. But uh, also, here are questions just to to to, to talk. What will um, be the advantages to be the European Union. I think this is a, one important issue to be discussed uh, uh, among my society. Uh, and the second one, just because of my this uh, theoretical background, I, as I mentioned, I was studying at uh, studying this science, uh, national nationalism and ethnicity, and I know this identity topics. Uh, I can say that a little more than the typical journalists know <laughs> in Georgia. So. Um, uh, um, and I want to ask, mention, and continue the uh, the role of language in identity politics because I think it was a case in Belarus, and we have uh, the representatives from Belarus, and I can ask just a question: What is the importance of language in identity policy, and how it works in the post-Soviet countries? So maybe this is the moment that we ask uh, our Belarusian guest, Mr. Vyachurka, just to speak about this issue of identity and language in the case of Belarus. Thank you for the question. Indeed, uh, sorry, just uh, indeed the a question of uh, selection of language uh, often was raised uh, within the radio uh, everybody knows that uh, it is easy to communicate uh, in Belarus using only Russian. So this is not a question of, of, of technical communication, of uh, uh, mutual understanding. This is a question of values, of self-identity. Uh, and um, I would like to say a question of choice of, of, of uh, future way of development of our country. Uh, in our part of Europe, uh, the process of uh, forming national states was artificially, artificially frozen. That is why sometimes the processes uh, which take place in Belarus, in Ukraine, uh, being described in uh, traditional terms of nationalism uh, and so on, are perceived in a wrong way by observers from the western part of our uh, continent. Uh, however, at the beginning of, of uh, 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 desovietization of our region, the returning to traditional historical values like historical memory, like language, uh, fully coincided with the uh, uh, choice of democratic way of thinking, with choice of uh, building of a democratic state. And I do hope that in Belarus this coincidence still remains. So choosing Belarusian language, we choose European values. This is my answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for this uh, first exchange with the, with the audience. Uh, I hope uh, uh, next will follow. Salome, uh, thank you very much for this. Xenia, uh, you are an expert in social and economic issues uh, and one of the focus of yours was uh, identity in Transnistria. Uh, in the light of this uh, debate about language, about uh, unfreezing of Soviet space, uh, what is your point while uh, 
following the debate of this morning about identity, freedom, um, Xenia, the floor is yours. Um, hello, everybody. That's I'm supporting my for the fellows that it's a big honor to be to be here and to participate in this conference. Um, I would like to. Firstly, I will answer to your question, and yes, I've been to Transnistria, and I, I, I had there the walking trip, and I try to, to understand what's national identity the people have there, but uh, the problem is that um, the young generation who is living there, they are very lost, uh, being um, in the being between these three nations living there and uh, between Russia, Moldova and Ukraine and uh, in the same time they are very influenced and they have very great impact on them uh, by, uh, uh, made by Russian uh, media because they, uh, uh, to my mind, uh, that Russian propaganda, Russian mm, misinformation has a uh, much bigger impact in uh, countries so where people uh, can't go outside, can't open the fridge, can't uh, um, compare easily the reality, uh, the, um, the media agenda, the agenda of Russian uh, channels, uh, most, uh, most important, like first channel, uh, Russia one, uh, with the reality. And that's why I think that the people who is living there, they are um, uh, much more influenced by the media um, media agenda, by Russian media agenda. Uh, but at the same time, that's happening as well in Transnistria, which is happening now in Russia, that a young generation, they are becoming more critical thinking thanks to social media, thanks to uh, media that exists in the Internet, and uh, they are not so... Um, confused probably and that's why when I talk to them I got different opinions. Uh, some people of course they are very um they are very pro, uh, pro Russian, they are very pro Putin, they consider Putin to be a, a strong leader, but there are some people, especially in the places which are organized um, by uh, some international communities, there is a club that financed by people in need. We don't know whether there will be a, f a function in, uh, further, because in Transnistria there is also the kind of the draft uh, law of uh, foreign agents that's happened in Russia. Uh, but still there is this place and they have meetings with uh, um, different uh, foreign guests and they are becoming more broad-minded and more critical thinking. Uh, but if you... the floor is still mine? Yeah? Sure. Okay. I'd really like to raise the question that wasn't discussed today, but I think it's very hot issues and it uh, unites... Uh, the US, it unites the European countries and Russia, of course. Recently we traveled to Washington and met people in the State Department uh, as a part of our program uh, who are raising the questions about the human rights abuse in Russia, uh, the threats uh, the journalists and civil activists uh, are receiving and the influence of the Kremlin propaganda, of course. Uh, mainly these people who work closely with uh, foreign policy and with Russian agenda um, they try to understand whether their measures are uh, effective enough. And, um, of course, one of the most remarkable initiatives that we discussed a lot there, there was uh, Magnitsky Act. Um, and before um, questioning, before um, asking the question, I would like to, to make two remarks, uh, just factual remarks. In the beginning of May, the lawyer of uh, Boris Nemtsov family, Vadim Prokhorov, wrote in social networks that uh, um, he proposed to, to produce an analog of Magnitsky Act that will be imposed on the uh, Middle East countries. And uh, because that's very important now, Middle East countries still investing in uh, one of the Russian regions that's becoming actually the probably the biggest threat to civil society. I'm talking about Chechen Republic. And uh, to my mind, um, somehow limiting investment is the right measure when uh, both, but in, in, in this uh, case, both sides uh, are getting losses. And uh, as we can see, the talk turns to another direction when uh, it concerns the economical um, 
profits of the country that impose in these sanctions. And uh, just, to, just to confirm it, on Saturday there was a document published on the website of uh, Ministry of Justice of the U.S. Um, claiming that the first Magnitsky Act case uh, has, fin has finished with pre-trial agreement. There was the, um, the, um, the case of son of the vice president of Fri Russian railways, and uh, the only one thing they need to, to do now is to pay six million dollars to the U.S. and it will be closed. It will be finished. So my question uh, to uh, probably to Mr. Karamorza and to uh, all the representatives of European countries, what agreements are needed to regulate it, to make it more effective? Because as we see now that um, if it concerns, when it concerns uh, of uh, the uh, economical profits, the countries just prefer to get them and uh, not to probably not to continue uh, and not to be so strict in their intentions. And of course for the representative European countries, uh, do you think that your countries um, can support the Magnitsky law and uh, do it as the US did? Thank you very much. So, Magnitsky Act. The first question goes to Vladimir Karamurza. About the effectiveness. Please, Vladimir, That's very come to the to stage. Hear your opinion. And the second would be from one of the member, EU member states? Yes. Okay. Maybe it's very interesting. Thank okay. you. Ksenia and yes, it works. It does? Oh, thank you. Ksenia, thank you for the question and for the opportunity to address this issue, the Magnitsky Act. Um, I was involved uh, in the process, in the original process to get the Magnitsky Act passed in the US and uh, I mean I, I did kind of some of the groundwork but the, the main person who was involved in it of course was uh, Boris Nemtsov and uh, John McCain, US Senator, who is one of the authors of the Magnitsky Act said that if it, weren't, if it weren't for Boris Nemtsov there would not have been a Magnitsky Act. Uh, this is how he estimated his role. And, uh, of course, uh, as you remember when, when this law was being discussed in the United States Congress, um, it was one of the stated priorities of the Putin government to stop this law from being passed. In fact, just four hours after his inauguration, on the 7th of May of 2012, uh, Mr. Putin signed a decree handing out different tasks to the Russian foreign ministry in foreign policy sphere, and that was one of the top issues there, to stop the passage of the Magnitsky Act. Because, frankly, there's nothing uh, that worries and gets them worked up as much as those kind of individual sanctions. <coughs> Um, I'll just remind you that, the, of course, the whole premise of the Magnitsky Act, uh, it really was a groundbreaking uh, law when it was passed five years ago because for the first time it introduced sanctions not against the country, not even against the government so much, but against specific individuals who are responsible for human rights abuse and corruption. And uh, Boris Nemtsov called it the most pro-Russian law in the history of any foreign parliament because it targets those people who abuse the rights of Russian citizens and who steal the money of Russian taxpayers. And, but of course it's clear why there is uh, nothing, more, um, nothing more horrible for the Putin regime than this because of course the nature of the regime we have in, in Russia now is, you know, there, there are many similarities we can discuss uh, between the Putin regime and the Soviet regime. We have media censorship, we have the lack of free and fair elections, we have uh, political prisoners, more than 100 political prisoners today according to Memorial. Uh, and, and I can go on about the similarities, but for all the similarities there's one important difference. And the difference is that members of the Soviet Politburo didn't keep their money in Western banks, didn't buy real estate and, and yachts and, and luxury properties in Western countries, didn't send their families to live and, and study in Western countries. The current regime and people around the current regime do that. So I think those kind of measures as the Magnitsky Act strike right at the heart of the corrupt vertical of power, corrupt and autocratic vertical of power that is Vladimir Putin's regime. Uh, so it was really groundbreaking when it was passed in the US. It wasn't easy. As you suggest, um, there are a lot of realpolitik types who care about profits and economic um, gains much more than some human rights. And we've encountered many of those while we were working for, to get the Magnitsky Act passed. In the US establishment, a lot of people like that. And of course, there are many people like that in the European Union as well. Uh, but just last December, so six months ago, Estonia became the first country, first member state of the European Union to pass its own version of the Magnitsky Law. One month ago, the United Kingdom, which is groundbreaking, I guess we can still count it as a European Union country, right? Uh, the UK passed its own version of the Magnitsky Law. It only went halfway. 
it only uh, imposed asset freezes but not visa bans, so there's still work to be done there. And of course we hope that other European Union countries follow, because I just think it's, it's a plain and simple principle that those people who violate and abuse and break the most basic principles of the civilized world should be allowed to use the privileges that the civilized world has to offer. So um, uh, I, we hope, and I know I speak not just for myself, but for many of my colleagues in the Russian opposition, we hope that many more European Union countries follow and pass their own Magnitsky laws and send a message to those crooks and human rights abusers in the Kremlin that they will not be welcome in Western countries. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the next on my list uh, uh, is Erhard Buzek. Uh, you are a lawyer. Magnitsky Act is, uh, is uh, in the field of law. Uh, you as former Vice Chancellor of Austria, uh, with all your experience, how you would advise uh, to handle this issue in, uh, in legal terms? Legal sense is difficult because I think if you're a well-trained lawyer, you can turn it around in every direction possible. I think that's one. I want to raise another question. So young journalists from these countries, we are, uh, which are in, without any uh, cause, in difficulties. And you are very much depending on being understood, not only in the State Department or in Brussels and so on and so on, but also in the public. I'm coming from a small country. We have some neighborhood uh, to Moldova and uh, Ukraine, as Austrians especially. Uh, and for sure, also a lot of immigrants coming, for example, from Georgia and so on and so on. The real problem for a better understanding is that there's not done enough information about your countries. I think it is misinformation mainly done, uh, and it is giving a wrong picture. I'll give you a primitive example. The Romanian government did uh, years ago a mistake. They distributed passports to Moldovan citizens, quite a huge number. That has one consequence. I think immigrants from Moldova are mainly marginalized people. So, if it is written in our newspapers, 80% of all sitting in the prisons from Romania, or with the Romanian passports, are Moldovans. And therefore, everybody is saying, ah, Moldova must be a horrible country uh, if they have uh, all citizens go going to, to, to prison. I don't want to blame you about this, but I think there should be done more information uh, about the value, about the content of your country, and so on and so. I think there is not uh, enough known, and it is not too much spread over. I think here efforts w would be quite necessary to do it. Uh, I think it's a quite a difficult task. I'm fully aware of this uh, because you are from beautiful countries uh, and so on and so on. But uh, there's not happening enough to, to do so. Maybe uh, you have also some oligarchs in your country. You can use the money of the oligarchs to do a better information outside of your country. Thank you very much for your re reaction and for this exchange. Ksenia, I, I will now ask Yaroslava. Mm -hmm. Yaroslava, you are from Ukraine, and what in this debate uh, um, is inspiring for you? Because we didn't speak about the limits uh, of uh, the European integration. So what was the issue you would like to develop from this morning and maybe raise also some question? Yeah, I actually, um, so, um, at Radio Free, it's it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, not only it is an honor, but it is also an intellectual adventure because um, you know being in a room with people with uh, so diverse and interesting backgrounds. Um, it was indeed very interesting to to listen to you, and uh, it actually made me think about a lot of um, global issues. Uh, I am particularly interested uh, in questions that uh, have to do with environment, and for Ukraine, uh, of course, um, you know, uh, in implementation of uh, laws uh, on environmental impact assessment is a part is a very significant part of uh, European integration, which has proven to be a painful and, and long one, but uh, there, is, uh, there is some progress in this direction. 
And uh, uh, today, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Bertoncini and uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Palacio um, mentioned climate change as um, one of the issues that European Union is dealing with. And what was particularly interesting for me as someone who was in Paris in uh, the end of 2015 when there was uh, uh, the Paris Agreement, which was signed by more than 190 countries, just to observe how um, the leaders of those countries, they committed to do their best uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, um, to implement reforms that would reassure that the uh, temperature rise will not go beyond two, uh, two degrees. But as we have seen later, if you look at the like the accumulative efforts and you sum together um, all the uh, individually uh, individual national contributions you would see that the best case scenario is uh, uh, three degrees and you know and um, the Paris Agreement was supposed to be like a blueprint of this um, uh, of how the um, global framework, uh, this super, uh, um, like supranational entity you were talking about in the beginning of this uh, uh, conference, how it, it could, could work. And, and now we see that it, uh, it doesn't work uh, in a way that um, um, it was supposed to be. So, um, and we're dealing with a kind of like prisoner's dilemma. So uh, we see that uh, rational individuals uh, uh, they are in fact not cooperating even though it would be in their best interest to do so. so. Um, and in, in this respect, uh, I would like to raise the question, um, how do you restore trust and how do you ensure accountability? And the question is for? And the, the question is, of course, uh, primarily to uh, Madame Palacio uh, and Mr. Uh, Bertoncini, uh, because they talked about climate change. And, you know, and the European Union was supposed to be uh, the, the pioneer and the leader in this uh, Thank respect. you. Anna Palacio, Madame Minister, are you here? I do not see the hand. Eve. May I ask you to react on this Paris Agreement? Please join me on the stage. Because we saw that uh, the newly elected uh, uh, President of France mm. engaged uh, himself to continue with this environmental uh, achievements uh, of uh, François Hollande. So what is your take on this? Well, I think the question has to be put uh, at the at the global level first and ask to Mr. Trump huh, whether mm -hmm. what he's going to do or not because it's true that Emmanuel Macron was quite clear on this I think this is a good example this um, Paris Agreement on Climate Change on the way the EU can be seen as an answer to threat to an external threat and uh, the way it can work uh, as regards its member states so I'll start by the first uh, uh, dimension uh, there is a, yes, a global threat, climate change, um, a kind of consensus in Europe, at least in Europe, but it's more and, less, more and more global, a consensus on the fact that there is a human responsibility for this and then a need to act. And so it has been made possible to have first the Kyoto Agreement and now the Paris Agreement and then to go further. Europe united in our diversity, convincing the world, convincing China and the USA to try and fight this uh, climate change and then, yes, to reduce the, 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 the temperature um, on a, under, under a certain extent. But I mean, in terms of, uh, of uh, what the EU is all about, I would say it's a perfect example. It's an answer to some global threats instead of being seen as a threat sometimes, threat to sovereignty, threat to... And precisely for the second element, in terms of sovereignty sharing, it's, 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 it's well designed because uh, not the Paris Agreement only, but I mean, the EU's fight against climate change, there is a, a collective responsibility at the world level and then the EU level, but then the countries are treated differently. 
yeah. depending on their I mean their 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 energy energy mix their their I mean the way they they can uh, pollute more or less their industrial history so I think it's it's well it's it's well done as well in the design in the respect of our unity in diversity so of course it has to be a trademark um, for uh, EU's achievements and then future um, it has to be defended and promoted even if Donald Trump was to opt out but apparently he is having an hesitation a severe hesitation on this because and that will be my final word, word on I come back on what we are as Europeans I, I had said that we are well 6% of the world population the member of the EU huh? 6% well, uh, with this, we produce a bit less than 25% of uh, GDP, 25%. 50% mm. uh, of the social expenditure, but only 11% of the greenhouse gas uh, emission, 11%. So it means that our economic model of development is quite, it's quite environmental friendly, I would say because 25% of GDP, only 11%. So we also need to insist on that. We have this model trying to combine economic effectiveness, but also environmental protection and social cohesion. The China is then doing is not making the same arbitration. I'm afraid the, the USA, led by M Mr. Trump, will not do the same as well. So we have to stick to that because we are united around this, uh, behind this model of development. Mm. Thank you very much for your uh, take, for your reaction. Maybe let's develop uh, the env environmental issue later on because on my list I have still one name and this is uh, Mirkica. Mirkica, you come from uh, uh, Macedonia and uh, you are the only representative of uh, Western Balkans. So either you have to speak long or to raise an interesting question. And we have uh, in the audience uh, one of the most uh, important experts on the issue, so just do not hesitate. Merikitsa, you covered Greece in the past, you are interested by issues of migration and of people leaving their own country as for a better or for another future. What is your take when uh, speaking about uh, European identity? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, when speaking about European identity and Macedonia in particular, one can say that we are sort of puzzled because openly on, in all the public polls we say that we want to be part of the European Union. But then when you see the protests that are supporting the, uh, the, the previous governing party, there are many anti-European slogans and uh, unwillingness from the side of the politicians that used to be in party uh, in government for the past uh, uh, nine years. N not you don't see the willingness to accept the advice that comes from the European Union. Macedonia is now facing one of the most serious political crises. It has been without a government for five months after the elections and has been going through this political crisis for uh, the past two years. Um, I mean, uh, we, we have seen uh, f falling and, you know, decreasing in uh, media freedoms, and we have seen decreasing in uh, democracy and appeals from all European officials to, you know, uh, st stick to the, uh, to the democratic principles if we want to become part of the European Union. We also hear about possible European EU sanctions against our president and previous uh, prime minister who are unwilling to uh, give the mandate to uh, form a new coalition government. I, I wanted to ask you, Mr. Rupnik, because you have been involved in the Balkans for a very long time, what do you think the EU can do now to uh, sort of keep this dream of uh, becoming part of the European Union alive among the people? Because you know the support uh, not maybe in the polls but we see that the support is sort of dropping the media that's being supported by the Vomero, uh, the, the, the right uh, party that has been in government for the past nine years is using every opportunity to attack some European countries to show that, show that democracy is not that high there but on the other side you know these politicians openly say that they, they are supporting Europe. So what can the EU do? EU politicians are run, running back to Macedonia at every opportunity and saying, you know, you should do this and that, but... 
maybe there is really some unfinished mm -hmm. business uh, in this part of the world and I would like to ask uh, Jacques Rupnik not as politician but, but maybe if you were advisor today of, uh, of Emmanuel Macron uh, or Jean-Claude Juncker what would be your advice concerning Macedonia concretely? Uh, well, uh, it, it, it's good that you reminded everybody I'm not a politician. Uh, <coughs> um, I think that uh, there are two things. There is uh, uh, the view from the Balkans, and there is a Macedonian question in the broader picture in the Balkans, and then there is the situation of the EU and what can it do about it or what it should do about it. And uh, so those who pay attention to the Balkans are absolutely, I think, there is a large consensus among um, analysts, experts, or people who have been involved with the region ever since the wars of the 1990s, that you cannot recover after the breakup of Yugoslavia, the wars, the delayed transitions to democracy, that you are unlikely to succeed unless you have a common purpose, unless you have uh, some common roof. What is the EU about? Uh, in uh, the countries of the former Yugoslavia. Basically, it's a substitute for an empire. You know, you had the empires of the past, the, the, the Habsburg Empire and the Ottoman Empire. You had Yugoslavia, which was a mini empire, which was, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically uh, providing a common roof. And when that common roof disintegrates, uh, people no longer feel secure. They feel they fall back onto their communities and you end up into a logic of ethnic conflict. So Europe, in a way, is a way of um, overcoming the decades of conflict and that remains the main goal and the small achievements we have seen in recent years, be it Croatia in the EU, be it the, the agreement between Serbia and Kosovo, uh, that has all happened within the prospect of the European Union. Now, the Macedonian question shows when things can go wrong and they can go badly wrong. Uh, first, you have one EU member state who insists that Macedonia should not be called Macedonia but FIROM, former Yugoslav Republic of M. Okay, so you already have the name battle uh, that everybody is familiar. Then you have a systematic blockage imposed by that country on any progress uh, uh, that has been made. And that has taken us uh, through all the way through the famous NATO summit in Bucharest in 2008 when single-handedly Greece blocked Macedonia's accession. From that moment, the promising developments that we had in Macedonia uh, uh, have started regressing. And we can really trace back the uh, setbacks to precisely that idea. The feeling Macedonians had that whatever we do, there will always be Greece to block us from the entry into the, uh, into the EU. So here is a country which is a candidate member received in 2008, uh, 2005, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, green light for accession, for accession negotiation. Hasn't started any uh, uh, negotiation and instead is retreating. And um, what we have now is of course, if you don't have the European option, you fall back onto the national option, the nationalist option, that of Mr. Gruevsky and the Macedonian nationalists, that of the Albanian minority and their nationalism, which I do not forget about. And basically, this is becoming a very dangerous and very risky situation. I will not speak for too long. I had one suggestion uh, last year when actually the, uh, there was a Balkan summit to be was preparing in Paris, and I was asked if I have a suggestion for that summit. I said, well, the, be the best thing, if you want to be remembered for this summit, you know, fix the Macedonian question. How do you do that? Well, you use your leverage with Greece. Here is a country which is a member of the Euro, which has been rescued single-handedly by France, as it was 
in the summer of 2015 about to be kicked out of the Eurozone. You may remember that one. I'm not now discussing whether it was a wise decision to rescue Greece at the time, but that leverage, uh, you want European solidarity to, to be uh, maintained in the Euro, you should remember European solidarity when Macedonia's accession is on the agenda, and therefore your objections about the name and, and other such should be lifted. If that two-pronged move could be done, that's what diplomacy should be about, and that's what the European framework could have provided. It didn't do so. It's never too late to do a good thing. Thank you very much for this very inspiring exchange, and the list of, uh, ch of challenges is not uh, over. We have maybe five minutes uh, uh, remaining, for five minutes, so maybe one question from the audience, if there is someone who is inspired by our young journalists uh, um, and uh, the countries and societies uh, they come from. Please, the floor is yours. Not for the time being, so I will have a question. Ah, Michael, sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question which is for Yaroslava. Uh, uh, two years ago, uh, Ukraine was in the midst of a war. I'm not saying the war went away. It's still uh, there on uh, the edge of our minds, but uh, compared to two years ago, the fighting has subsided somewhat. Now, uh, we don't hear as much about Ukraine uh, in Europe uh, as we did then. And of course, Maidan was the uh, heroic moment, and uh, as uh, is our unfortunate custom with heroic moments, we think that everything will go well from now on, uh, after the Velvet Revolution, after the Arab Springs, after Maidan and after all the, the other uh, recent uh, uh, civil uh, upheavals. But uh, there is some evidence that not everything has uh, uh, gone well since uh, Maidan and that in some uh, ways there has been some uh, slipping back to the era of uh, oligarchs and uh, corruption and uh, personal fiefdoms uh, in 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 the country and uh, and uh, many of us do not have enough information to gauge the validity of that so it would be invaluable if we could get your own take on the on the subject well uh, i would i would like to um, you know provide some optimism uh, because um, um, of course uh, I would say that the, the majority of the population in the country where television is the most popular source of information still uh, especially among the people of older generation uh, you know I would say that many people uh, in, in the rural areas they also lack you know, um, objective uh, uh, information because they still watch TV channels that are owned by oligarchs. And uh, as you understand, uh, of course, those people who are um, mainly representatives of the younger generation, they uh, they um, t take information more critically, and then they uh, they go online and they try to um, you know to trouble themselves with looking into the fresh investigations on the corruption on uh, high levels of political establishment, which is very important, you know, that uh, those cases that they were exposed and that the public was aware of how the state money and uh, the money from the Western investors are distributed. And uh, I think that... Um, what is good is that, for instance, there's some burgeoning journalist initiatives 
that are that occur now in in, in Ukraine, for instance, uh, the web source which is trying to refute uh, the uh, the fake news, stop fake. It's gaining more and more uh, attention, and it, it, its audience is broadening, and they're now uh, publishing their uh, stories in seven or eight languages. And um, we have uh, Hromatske, which started as a crowdsource uh, you know, initiative and journalists were almost, they were working almost on pro bono terms and now the, 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 they provide um, high quality coverage of current affairs and especially of the situation in, in uh, the, the eastern regions and uh, Crimea. And uh, we, we also are now um, dealing with the transformation of our first state TV channel into public broadcasting, which is also, you know, an interesting uh, situation to, to observe. And, you know, and there is a lot of hope that uh, uh, th thanks to, to this, uh, um, you know, um, the, 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 the coverage of the events in Ukraine, it will, of course, uh, improve. And uh, I would like to also highlight that, that for instance, people from Hromatske and uh, um, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, is trying to, to extend the coverage of the situation in, in uh, eastern Ukraine and in, in Crimea Peninsula. And uh, when their articles uh, uh, published uh, in, in Ukrainian there, also translated into English. So those people who are interested in the situation in Ukraine, uh, I, I don't think that they have problems uh, with getting the first-hand information. It's just the problem is rather whether they are inclined and whether they are, you know, encouraged. And uh, it's, a, it's rather a, a personal matter. Thank you very much, Yaroslava. We have just few uh, remaining moments. Maybe, Stefan, uh, what would be the message for you to uh, uh, people who would be in interested to know more about Václav Havel? What is the key word, the key idea, the key message you get while applying for Václav Havel Journalism Fellowship and what you have learned uh, being in Prague. What is your take? One word, one idea, one phrase. Stefan. I think the main idea uh, which people who should know about uh, Václav Havel is that uh, you need to fight uh, for the liberty and for freedom of speech and this is not easy to obtain and uh, this is not given, just given. You need to fight for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ksenia, you would like to complete? Stefan? Uh, I would like just to add that uh, when I applied for, for the fellowship, I read uh, one letter of Václav Havel and uh, he wrote that uh, we will have um, uh, long lasted consequences of the violation of human rights, of uh, human rights abuse. So I think that um, um, we shouldn't, in, our, um, in the case of our country, for example, now we're challenging the same uh, we're, we're facing the, cha the same challenges, and um, we shouldn't miss another opportunity because we missed lots of opportunities, probably in 2004, in 2012, in 2008 maybe, and uh, we shouldn't lose another opportunity not to have uh, like longer lasting consequences after that. Thank you very much. Salome, what's yes. have a key idea for uh, you? Yes, I will add very shortly. For me, uh, he was talking a lot about responsibility, responsibility of citizens, state, and uh, the, just the individuals. And for me, uh, as a journalist, responsibility is one of the main value. Uh, when we have responsibility, what we are doing, for, for, for what we are doing, what we are talking, what we are informing, how we are informing society, um, it, it is a much of the, um, the, the, the big value for me. So I think I will follow this value to have responsibility every time, every minute when I'm saying something as a journalist. 
Thank you very much, Mirkitsa, for you. Václav for Havel, key idea. I will, con I will connect Václav Havel with Eugene Dinsbir, who is the pat patron of my fellowship and that is, you know, uh, battling always for human rights. He said that, and, uh, and I believe Mr. Schweizendijker also mentioned it, that uh, Czech, Czech, the Czech Republic, drawn on its own past experience, should always fight for human rights wherever there is a conflict in the world. And I believe this is the general idea, you know, that I would like to... Thank you for your take, both for Jerzy Dinsbir and Václav Havel fellows of the fight against a totalitarian regime and Yaroslava, last but not least, you. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to add that uh, Václav Havel himself, he was uh, uh, saying that it's important not to for forget to distance sometimes uh, from, from the, uh, yourself from the situation and perceive information with, with humor. And I think that, uh, you know, when we're dealing with uh, very complex and uh, uh, challenging issues, we sometimes have to distance and see the situation from a different angle. Thank you very much. With that, please join me by applauding our young journalists. Thank you. I think now we have a very 10 minutes break. Okay, 10 minutes break. Thank you. Enjoy.